Welcome to With Love and Rage, the podcast of Extinction Rebellion NYC. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Greg Bertone, and I'll be your host for today. On today's podcast, we're sharing highlights from our first Conversations on the Anthropocene, an online discussion series meant to open a space to have the difficult conversations about climate change. In this talk, we had the pleasure of welcoming two amazing writers and fellow members of XR. Novelist Jenny Offill, who is the author of Last Things, Department of Speculation, and most recently, Weather. And author Jesse Jawiski stevens who recently released her debut novel, The Exhibition of Persephone Q. We've put links to Jenny and Jesse's novels in our show notes. We urge you to purchase their books through bookshop.org, which gives a percentage of every order to local bookstores and not Amazon, because God knows Jeff Bezos has enough money. In the first part of our discussion, I spoke with Jenny and Jesse about our collective grief, activism, and climate change narratives. In the second half, we took questions from the online audience and tackled some provoking questions, including the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on their thinking about climate change, ecological intersections, and much more. Thanks for tuning in. So I'm just going to jump into the questions. So I'm going to start with you, Jenny. Uh, and weather strikingly captures the kind of balancing act that we go through now in everyday life while, you know, dealing with the mundane, but also dealing with this rising storm of dread that's building around us when we kind of think about the climate crisis. Um, did you have a particular moment where you had this realization or kind of awakening? Mm. Well, it's like in certain you know, Buddhist traditions, though, they talk about the difference between there's the kind of gradual enlightenment and the sudden enlightenment. And I think I, I fall more into the gradual in that I had a friend who, Lydia Millet, who's worked for many years in environmental organizations. And I'd just been talking to her for 10 years about all these things. And so it was a little bit of a slow, slow drip of dread about it. But there was one moment where I think in terms of deciding to write about it and to kind of dig deeper. Yeah, there was a moment where I saw a chart, an interactive chart that they put online. I don't know if it was Climate Central or someone else. And it was about climate departure. And you could put in your city and see what year they thought that the temperatures would no longer match anything that um, had been in the historical averages. So it was the moment where sort of we no longer recognize our climate at all. And I just remember typing in New York and seeing 2047 and being startled really at, at how soon that was. And, and like many things, it's probably actually going to be sooner than that um, since so many of these models are often actually a little conservative, but um, I sort of did the math. I thought how old my daughter would be. So I thought that, you know, she was going to be in her 40s, barely in her 40s. And I was just thinking that if she herself had children, how little what I knew would translate to anything I could tell her and help her because they would be living in such a transformed world. And, and for me, that was kind of, you know, it, people talk about this in climate circles, you know, the sort of like, oh shit moment. That was definitely definitely it. Like I never kind of unknew things after that. Before that, I felt like I was sometimes in kind of a twilight state of knowing where I would think about it and then it would go away and then I would think about it again. And that was sort of, that was probably about six or seven years ago. Yeah, I think mine was the IPCC report, which gave me the initial kind of punch in the face. And then, yeah, slowly, yeah. slowly over the years, I'm like, well, this is, you know, take care of this. <laughs> yeah, once you start actually reading the reports, I feel like, oh, wow, you're really, that, th then it gets really dark. <laughs> so Jesse, the main character, Percy, is kind of as restless, untethered, uh, wanders the streets every night with insomnia, unsure of where she is going and where she is kind of meant to go. Have you felt a similar kind of restlessness in terms of just your overall feeling creep into your skin when you think about climate change? And how has that kind of been for you, that realization? Yeah, I, yeah, I would say yes, especially, you know, the insomnia, climate induced insomnia. <laughs> I think when you do let yourself really accept and acknowledge the scale of the problems that we're facing, I mean, it feels very difficult then to go on with daily life. But I think that that, that restlessness too is probably one of the reasons that I also found myself getting more involved in XR, following climate, reading IPCC reports, and beginning to think about how... Um, I could get more involved. So I think it is, you know, maybe following those kind of aha moments of what is the world going to look like for, for my children? You know, for, you know, what is the city going to look like in, in 10 years? You know, maybe it's also a fork in the road moment where you can feel so paralyzed. And then it is that sort of moment where you realize 
something like just telling the truth or just showing up, you know, that kind of ethos of, of places like X, XR start to feel like the only outlet for that kind of restlessness or that kind of fear too. So. Absolutely. Jenny, in modern life, we're kind of rarely given the opportunity to slow down and properly grieve um, the planet and the slow deterioration of a lot of the things that we love. So how do you see grief being tooled as a kind of communication tool? Well, I think one of the things when I, when I first started going deeper into the climate stuff and questions, I, I did... I really longed to be around other people that were as sad about it as I was and as anxious and all of those things. And, and it was, um, there were plenty of people out there, but I just didn't really know them at that point, except for my one friend who'd been doing it for a while. And I remember like a really early interesting moment for me was that I went to a dark mountain retreat and a guy who started that, Paul Kings North, kind of famously walked away from the uh, environmental movement that he'd been a, a leader in Britain for many years. And, and he wrote this article in Orion magazine. And he was basically saying, I feel like a priest who no longer believes in God. I don't believe that, that all these like false notes of uplift that we're, that we're putting at the end of every environmental uh, thing. We I, don't, I don't believe it. I want to go and I'm going to walk away and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think and I'm going to grieve. And I remember being very interested in that. In fact, it was kind of the beginnings of why I wrote this novel, because I wanted to write about a, a climate activist who decided to walk away. And, but I also thought to myself, as someone that didn't know that much about it at the time, I thought, how bad is it that he's saying that, that he's saying um, that he can't stand up there anymore and talk about it. But also, there is a relief in, in, in not having to falsify how, how bad it is and not sort of getting the usual pushback that when you're talking about climate stuff, um, you know, people tend to give where, where they say, oh, but people have always been saying it's the end of the world or, oh, but it's not going to be any worse than et cetera, et cetera. One of the funny things about writing the book over a period of six or seven years is that people just got less and less like that, I guess, as more and more, I don't know. I mean, we've all noticed that I'm sure who are, who are part of the movement that like there has been an upswing in kind of people recognizing how serious it is and, and talking about things like climate dread um, and grief. Yeah, it's definitely trying to find more people that, you know, to communicate with. That's, that's what I went through, you know, a year ago. That's why it also drew me to XR was just the community and the space to, to talk about those feelings. Um, Jesse, do you have anything that you want to add about kind of grief as a communication tool and narrative? Yeah. I mean, I think especially now, it feels especially true that grief is a kind of collective emotion as well. That idea of, of seeking others um, to, to grieve with, like, I think it is a social emotion. And so I think in, in the middle of this pandemic, I think there is so much collective grief. And I, I like the the idea of clearing an opportunity to have a collective climate grief too, especially because having any kind of collective feeling, I also feel is something that can be activated. You know, if we are all mourning something together, we will need to mourn together. Uh, but to feel connected in that way, you know, there are obviously still many things that we can do. So I, I think it's something that is healing and also necessary for activism, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Jenny, you've admitted in the past that you were the person at the at the parties to bring up climate change. And I think a lot of activists are familiar with a Debbie Downer moment where you try to bring it up and your friends are just not having it. With this pandemic, have you kind of witnessed people in your own life having the um, willingness to, to speak about these things in a, in a more open way? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think that I noticed that I somehow, my my Doomer reputation meant that in the kind of early weeks of the pandemic, especially in New York, a lot of people were calling me, asking me, should I stay? Can I leave? What would it mean to do this? Can I go out here? Can I, you know, lots of people couldn't leave at all, but a few could, and they were all deciding at that moment. You know, one of the things when I was studying about disaster psychology for the novel is I just kept coming up against this idea of like the normalcy bias and the sense that our brains are really they really want to believe that what they're seeing is something they've seen before. So a lot of times when there's an emergency, humans just don't want to 
admit that it's emergency to themselves because then they have to take in that new reality and take in the loss that it might entail. And, and so I feel like that's one of the, the things that with the pandemic, when it really, everyone who thought, oh, it's not gonna be that bad. I think by any measure, it has been that bad. And so I think there's been a little bit of an opening up to discussions of what does it mean to feel this level of, of anticipatory dread and existential fear about something? What does it mean for these ideas that we talk about, about things being interconnected? What does it mean to see that in such a sort of frightening, sudden way where everything you touch, you think about everyone else has touched it, or where suddenly a lot of people who do things in their daily life that maybe people haven't been appreciating or haven't been noticing are now, if you're paying any attention at all, you should be thinking about the person that delivers your mail or the person who um, is stocking the shelves or pumping gas, all those things. And so I feel like in the early days after the pandemic, I kept getting a lot of requests to, to write essays about like how, how the pandemic was going to change things and how was it going to have to do with our understanding of, of climate change. And it all felt really early. And like the last thing I wanted to do was do a hot take on any of that because it was evolving. The only thing I guess I see now is that we are having this very difficult, very harrowing experiment of what it means to live in a more constrained way and a more local way. And I, I hope that when, when we're on the other side of the pandemic, I hope that some of the ways that we rebuild from the social structures that have been so torn to pieces during this or revealed to be in shreds, I hope that as we rebuild, some of the climate things can also be put in as a piece, that we, we rebuild resiliency in, in these systems in all sorts of ways. Um, so that's my hope. And I feel like people are a little more open maybe to talking about that, about how, how thinly stretched our social systems are, I think has become abundantly apparent. And um, obviously the things that happen with climate change only cause similar kinds of, of, of fraying. Yeah, we are fragile. The structures around us are very fragile. And that's definitely apparent at the moment. Jesse, do you, have you had more of these conversations in the recent weeks and months? Um, have you seen that willingness to talk? I mean, I, I see the willingness amongst those who were willing to talk about it before, certainly. I, I mean, I do think that it feels important that we're framing this also as a mental public health crisis, you know, with the idea of trying to, as as a global community, wrap our heads around the idea of climate change too. And I do think it's important that, you know, as, as Jenny said, I think there is a lot of attention paid to, to the importance of social services as much as we have adapted as individuals and in recognizing, you know, we are all just biovectors who are sharing an environment and our, we are responsible for one another. You know, it does also feel really important to keep in mind that, you know, having strong social structures and organization at national and international levels is just absolutely important. You know, like that, that absolutely is the first step. So I do think that it's really important that those conversations have been at the forefront, that a lot of people are talking about this as an opportunity to address so many forms of social violence that were really, that were so serious before this and that were underreported and that um, climate change is, is absolutely one of them, especially because there is a tendency in the U.S., I think, to emphasize individual action and how individuals are adapting and that we have seen so much resilience at that level, especially during the pandemic, but it's so important to remember that that can never replace um, commitment at at the level of, of international national you know government efforts so I mean I would love to see um, something like the Green New Deal be you know really integral to economic recovery after this so I'm glad to see that being thrown around absolutely just before I toss it up for the q and I just wanted to ask a lighter lighter question because I think a lot of activists and writers who are writing about climate change we spend a lot of time thinking about dark subjects, where are you finding your inspiration um, and hope at the moment? Well, I must say I'm, I'm enjoying the, the slower pace of things. I mean, today with my daughter, we were trying to think of something to do and we, we decided we would go and just drive to another town and pick up a book 
that we were looking for in another town. And it was surprisingly fun. There wasn't really any, we, we brought our food. We went in the car for an hour. We picked up a book on the sidewalk. We went for a walk and it was pretty good. It didn't, it didn't really feel like there needed to be a lot more um, bells and whistles to it. And I feel like maybe even a couple months ago, there would have been, at least I would have, I would have added, you know, we would have gone places. We would have bought something. We would have done this. We would have done that. And so I feel like there's a lot of that and, and I'm sort of re <laughs> I'm relearning as I often do in any time of like life getting shitty, or like how much music is like a godsend. And if you can just like listen to the music you want to listen to, I'm, con I'm my parents live down the road and they recently moved here and they're very, you know, they're a lot at risk in the pandemic. So I'm shopping for them. And, but when I get in the car to drive back, I find that I basically am acting more or less like I'm 16 and I've just been given my first car. Like I have my windows down I'm playing my music incredibly loud. I'm like banging on the thing and, <laughs> because it's also the only time in the day I'm alone. And it's just, but it's kind of like those moments are not, they're very fun. Like the rest of it is often like tedium and, is swinging back and forth between tedium and terror, but the, the moments of fun and joy feel very highlighted right now. And for me, that's, that's the car and the radio. <laughs> Absolutely. And Jesse? Yeah, I, I think, I think Jenny's so right about, in a sense, this is a constrained version of life, but it is a slightly slower uh, pace of life and that there's a lot of, of joy to be found in that. I mean, um, uh, my, partner has a full-time job and he usually goes to, to work and I work from home and now we are both working from home and I've, you know, I like having him around. I'll be sad when he goes back to work. Um, and uh, so in a way, even though we are more isolated, you know, I'm, I am more in touch with my friends. I, I will call my friends so that we can cook dinner together. I will, I'm calling my parents more. And, you know, I think that those of us who live in New York also realize how easy it is to live in New York and not see each other. Um, so I, I think there is a kind of connectedness. And, and even maybe it reminds me of your, of your previous question that taking the time to have more of those uh, slower conversations, I think, has also opened up more space to, to talk about things that, that matter and to, to care for one another and how we are trying to process heavy things. Beautiful. So I'm going to open it up. I see the first question here is from Kelly. Um, so Kelly, would you please unmute yourself and ask a beautiful question? Hi guys. I'm wondering what's shifted for you guys since COVID started, specifically in regards to how we're addressing climate change, but more broadly about anything that you're moving through in the world? Well, I... I don't know if I should feel guilty saying this, but I, I feel a little guilty, but I will say it's the first time that I felt like I could not worry about climate change for a little while in the very first uh, weeks of this, when I was still reading all the stuff I normally read about CO2 levels and things that are going on. I, I was like, this is such an unusual sensation to be getting like not bad news when I'm reading. Um, but, but it wasn't, anything that you could take in the way you would when you'd wish for it before, because it was against the backdrop of it's only happening because everything's being shut down because of this immense disaster and loss of life. So I think my first, to be honest, my first response was the pandemic was that I'm not going to think about climate change for a while. I'm going to be thinking about these very specific things, which, you know, were mostly down to bringing food to people and figuring out like sort of logistical things and, all my students had to go home and some of them didn't have an easy way to get home or didn't have a good situation to go home. So there was a lot of, you know, my whole novel's about being a fake shrink. And I was like very hardcore fake shrinking it there for a while um, in the beginning. So, but now I'm starting to feel like it's just really interesting to have seen these mutual aid societies, you know, spring up and to see also, I think we all know it's shocking, even if you know it, it's shocking to see that they can shut everything down if they need to. It's shocking to watch the airline industry shut down or the whatever. And so I think it's given a sense of if people recognize climate as an emergency in the way that the pandemic clearly is an emergency, 
what are the possibilities has been kind of percolating a lot since that started. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like an enormous, you know, social experiment in a way. And, you know, that is, it is coming out of tragedy, but it does feel like this moment when the world feels so different. And, you know, as, as Jenny is saying, we are seeing how systems can shut down and adapt in the midst of an emergency. I think it also opens up um, a space of kind of imagination, you know, like everything that we thought um, that the world that that really can't shut down, that really can't change, you suddenly had to adapt, you know, really on a dime for, for a public health crisis, for an emergency. And, you know, I think that over the next few months, this is going to be just as much an economic emergency. Um, and thinking about how, you know, now that we're looking at when you shut down the economy, this is what happens to, you know, emissions drop by 8%, which is about what the IPCC report says that we need to achieve over the next few years yearly. How do we maintain something like that? I think for me, my worldview has very much been shifting into really marrying that idea of economic and, and climate well-being as, as something that needs to be kind of at the center of, of how we are adapting uh, to the climate emergency. Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, next question, James, can you ask your question? Yeah, so I guess I have a comment and a question. In the interest of transparency, we are Jesse's parents, so she does call <laughs> home, but it's never... Hey, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, so, I, I think I've, my parents were going to watch too, but I think I forgot to send them the link. We could have had a whole, like, parent thing. Yeah, good job, yeah. Jenny. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the question. So, we think a lot and talk a lot about the fact that opinions about climate change and opinions about COVID-19 seem to track really closely with whether you're conservative or liberal, to use the labels. How do you, if we have to act as a community, how do we actually get outside our own echo chamber? How do we actually get people to think about the reality? I was looking the other day at the Stephen Colbert quote that reality has a well-known liberal bias. If the reality of the data is viewed as liberal, how do you actually get us to think and act across this chasm to act as a community? And how do you as writers help us communicate yeah, better? Right, that's the question. How do you as writers help nudge us to action um, when it's hard to see the next step? Um, well, Jesse, do you want to go first or? <laughs> We'd like to hear from um, you, Jenny. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think that um, writing, at least the way that I normally think of it, it's, it is an act of sort of imaginative empathy. And I think one of the things that, that we do need, especially when we're going to try to cross these very deep ideological lines, is if we can't quite always manage empathy, I think there needs to be some humility in the fact that we don't understand as much as we think we do about everyone around us. I, in my travels for, for my book, one of the things that would constantly surprise me, because I, I made a sort of habit of always talking to whoever, you know, was, was driving the car or the taxi or whatever. And often someone would, would have very, very conservative ideas. And yet in other ways they would not fit what I might imagine the person would have that is either they would be not white and have these ideas and I would be sort of surprised that they were as sold on President Trump as they seem to be or or they would go on to say that that many people in their family were from the backgrounds of these people that were being denigrated or whatever and but what I did hear was at the risk of simplifying was I heard a, a huge amount of loneliness and one of the things that I think we, we might need to like think of as writers and as uh, just in general is that things like talk radio and things like some of these cable news shows, they're filling this void of, of loneliness, of someone talking to you and telling you, hey, this is why the world is the way it is. Here's, you know, you're important. You, you feel like you've been neglected, but, but here's a storyline in which you, you can still feel central. And I feel like maybe just when we write trying to remember that there's always those surprises of someone where you think you know everything about who they are and they're not and when you can write about that with that kind of uh a little bit of that 
emotional generosity. I think that's what we all need right now. And, you know, there's always going to be, there's always going to be these moments, whether it's about taking care of, you know, everyone's concerned about their families and taking care of the vulnerable people in their lives. And I think making some stories that are about our shared vulnerability instead of this old mythos about American, you know, like, oh, we, nobody needs anyone, you know, we're just going to ride out on our horses into the sunset. I think telling more stories that are about these shared responsibilities is true to America too. Yeah, I mean, I think that all of my favorite writing and my favorite novels have a kind of empathy for the folly of the human condition. Um, and so I think being able to create situations on on the page where we can just recognize uh, how how difficult it is to to do things right, I think has its own um, kind of space. I mean, in terms of crossing ideological boundaries, you know, we've talked at, at multiple points in this conversation about, you know, grief as kind of a collective emotion. And, and you know, to, to Jenny's point of loneliness, I think narratives that are about some of the common denominators here on, on the climate change, that, that it is about grief, that it is about existing in an environment of others, that it is about sharing an environment. You know, I think that those, those are the kinds of narratives that um, I think can be successful over the next few years as we tackle, you know, probably one of the greatest challenges we've ever, we've ever had, so. Yeah, thank you. Great question, James. Thank you for that. Um, thank you, Jenny. We're going to start an XR talk radio station, so that's going to happen. Great. Um, Sarah, you have the next question. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm pretty active in XR, and I, I wanted to ask if you're familiar with an active in, in Extinction Rebellion, the third demand, which is for a call for citizens' assemblies to essentially step over what was just talked about, the sort of divide. And recognizing that, that action for us now is quite changed, you know, in terms of how we can have an impact. But I wondered if you felt optimistic about the prospect of this kind of real democracy coming to New York City, for instance. And I, I would love to hear just kind of your creative thoughts about, about those prospects. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, do, I think it's one of the things that I was drawn to about XR. I like the idea of the Citizens Assembly and I like the idea of just something where you're codifying the need for a cross section of voices because obviously some of the criticisms that have been made about XR and about previous environmental movements, about them being too narrow in their perspective or not diverse enough in their membership, I feel like I like the active approach to trying to, to broaden the reach and to, and to be an open door kind of for more people to bring their thoughts. Because one of the things I really think is true about adaptation to the climate crisis is I think that it's natural for people to be looking for some big thing. And we, we you know, we have all these uh, sort of ridiculous tech people who want to like do, or oh, we'll, we'll terraform Mars instead, or we'll do these big giant projects. But I think that actually my experience, what gives me hope is all of these very small initiatives that are being done all over the world, whether it's transition towns or some of the things that um, are being done with XR itself. I feel like, people looking at what's right in front of them and deciding what they can do. And I think a citizen's assembly is an extension of that because it's going to be necessarily local about like people talking about what's going on in their part of the world and how they best want to build resilience. So I think, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great part of the, the demands that are made. Yeah. yeah. I, I also, I would agree, and I, I think it's also important to recognize how important it is to marry activism with, you know, the basic assumption of the Citizens Assembly, to marry that with uh, political power, because we, you know, we, we cannot actually address um, climate change and do what we need to do if we don't, if we don't have um, the, the political avenues to, to change things. So, and I also, I also like this idea of, um, of making government more local, and I think that one of the things 
you know, especially at the national level, uh, when the administration, you know, kind of drags its feet, I, I do start looking more for opportunities for, for change at the local level, you know, even something like the Governor's Alliance or looking at what's going on at the level of states when it seems like an especially difficult moment to get something through at the national level. So I think keeping in mind that one of the aims um, is having these goals realized um, in policy and then also having a, a local perspective are, are two things that I think are really important that, that the Citizens Assembly foregrounds. Thank you. Um, um, maybe we'll do one more. I see Mari has a question and wrap us up there. Hi. Um, yeah, speaking of encroachment on wildlife areas, I was wondering if either of you see the pandemic as part of the ecological crisis and if that comes up in conversations you've had, pandemics being symptoms of ecological breakdowns. You want to take that, Jesse? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think that we could frame it more um, as, as an ecological crisis. I do think that framing it as an ecological crisis is useful in reminding us again that we are part of the environment, um, that, that there isn't this, this separation. I mean, I, I can't help but think I, I, more than an ecological crisis though, to be honest, I have been thinking about this more as part of the refugee crisis and that I very much do think of as the refugee crisis as also an ecological crisis. And so in, in terms of framing crises that we are familiar with as ecological crises, that, that is one that before the pandemic, um, felt that, that those two issues felt very much the same. I know, I mean, there's um, a cyclone in the Bay of Bengal right now. There are already, um, you know, millions of refugees uh, who, are, um, who are stationed in camps in Bangladesh and in West Bengal and layering something like the pandemic over an ecological disaster there, over the fact that, you know, mangrove forests um, which are also under threat from climate change, are one of the, the major kind of buffers against these, these sorts of cyclones. I mean, you just see the, the intersectionality of all of those crises are, are really difficult to ignore. So I think that's a great question and beginning to frame maybe every crisis as having ecological elements is uh, probably an important um, frame of reference to bring to the next few years. Absolutely. I think we'll probably wrap it up there. Um, I just want to say again, thank you so much, uh, Jenny and Jesse. If you need another encouragement, please buy Weather and uh, the Exhibition of per uh, Persephone Q, both great books. So yeah, as we said, if you're interested in learning more about XR, follow the link to our website and you can find a bunch of events and, and resources and um, just know a little bit more about us. Um, and this is the first segment of conversations on the Anthropocene. So we're hoping to have more. And so keep an eye out on the events page. And again, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks so much hey, for all the excellent questions. Thanks everybody for coming. Yeah. Great. Thanks again. Hope to see you on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you very much to our guests, Jenny Offill and Jesse Jawiski stevens This has been a production of Extinction Rebellion NYC. We have no sponsors, as we are an all-volunteer movement fueled by love and rage. Visit us online at xrebellion.nyc. See you online or in the streets. <laughs>